Why are we evangelical? The word evangelical means sharing good news. Why do we have this idea that we share good news, that we have good news to share, that we have a message and a call to be evangelizing to those around us? Well, in the book of John is written by the Apostle John, who we could also call Pastor John, because he was a pastor in Ephesus um, in the later part of his life. Pastor John is going to share with us a story in John chapter 4. Let's go ahead and start in, and let's read verses 1 through 6. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus didn't, himself did not baptize, but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. But he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city in Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave his son, to his son, Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. And so John is going to tell us this story in John chapter 4. So when did this story take place? Well, Jesus attended the Passover feast in Jerusalem on three different occasions during his ministry, three years in a row. This passage, John 2 and 3, covers the first Passover in Christ's ministry, and then chapter 4 is his way home from there. So Christ had been teaching publicly in Jerusalem, but that was starting to raise some eyebrows. We see that in verse 1 when Jesus learned that the Pharisees heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John. See verse 3, he, he ditched, he left. It's like, time to get out of here. The Pharisees are on to me, under pressure, time to leave. And so Jesus is leaving Jerusalem from his first Passover in, during his ministry, and that means that it's springtime, March or April, something like that. Nice weather. So it's an ancient road trip with, his, with Jesus and his disciples back home to Galilee. So where does this story take place that John wants to tell us? Well, in the region of Samaria, in the town of Sychar. Historically, since Genesis, this place has been known as Shechem. Abraham had set up camp there in Genesis 12. Jacob had dug a well. Jacob had bought a piece of land there. Good. Shechem is set dramatically at the foot of Mount Gerizim and Mount Eval, and where the one valley between them comes out into a larger valley. The, between these two mountains, there's a beautiful little amphitheater, a double horseshoe shape, where the tribes of Israel pronounce the blessings or curses on the left and on the right in the book of Joshua. In Jesus' day, the Samaritans were living in this region. The Samaritans were half descendants of Israel and half descendants of some of the Persian people that were moved to the land of Israel by the Assyrian Empire. And Samaritans were worshipping on this Mount Gerizim. Um, the Samaritans had half lineage from Israel and from foreign people in the Persians, and so also their religion was also kind of half-bred, where they had some of Israel's theology, but only some of it. So they had this temple on Mount Gerizim built up there, and the Jewish Jews obviously disagree with worshipping outside of Jerusalem, and so a Hasmonean Jewish king came over and tore it down about a hundred years before Jesus and the Samaritan woman were talking at the well in sight of Mount Gerizim on the foot of the mountain. Today, this place is a major Palestinian city in the West Bank known as Nablus. To this day, if you were to visit Israel, 
you can actually visit Jacob's well and you can pull up a bucket of water to drink yourself. As I reach for water, water is a hot topic in the Middle East. You've probably seen a movie where the characters are walking across a Middle Eastern desert and they've run out of water. In the Middle East, to have water is to have life. And to not have water is to be dead. I was talking to a Nepali man who had worked in Dubai as a low-level employee of an oil corporation. He was given his orientation to working in the Gulf states. His manager took a glass of oil and said, you, you can waste a glass of oil while you are here, but never waste a glass of water in the Middle East. So Jacob's well was a, the source of life for the people in that area. This well, to this day, has a small circular mouth about a, a foot and a half across at ground level, but it's curved much larger under the surface. It opens up to an eight-foot diameter shaft that plunges down at least 100 feet. Rain that had fallen years ago was stored deep inside the soils, beneath the valley, and it came into the well, and they could pull it up for life. So every day, someone from each household in Sychar had to walk water back from the well for household use. If they ran, they had running water. Conveniently, <laughs> conveniently, the well was also right on the walking trail that formed the main artery from Jerusalem through Samaria and north to Galilee and beyond. Which brings us back to Jesus. Jesus and his disciples have been walking for five or six hours that day. By the time they come to the valley of Shechem with, it, with, with its two mountains and the well along the trail. The disciples leave Jesus by himself as, at the well as they take a quick jaunt into Sychar to buy lunch. And so there Jesus is, alone at the well. I don't know what exactly Jesus is thinking at this point. Maybe he was only thinking about the journey, maybe his mission ahead, what he was going to eat that night or what the disciples were buying. Or maybe he was looking at that well and had a conversation with God the Father in prayer. Maybe Jesus started to think about how this well had brought life to the towns here for the last 2,000 years. Did Jesus suggest to his heavenly father that perhaps this well is like the gospel? That just as these people found physical life in the well, that humanity would find spiritual life by faith in him? Maybe the father whispered back, Jesus, nice idea. You should mention that idea about you, like the well. You should mention that to the next person that comes along. I don't know. I don't know if that's the conversation that the, the Lord had with Father God at that point. But I want us to see the similarity between the well and Christ. We need water for physical life, and we need Christ for spiritual life. We could call Jesus the greater well where we get eternal life. Jesus is the great well. Now enters our second main character in verses 7 through 10. Let's read them. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. So here comes a woman from the town of Sychar out to the well to fill her water pot. As she comes to the well, she sees that there's someone sitting on the well. 
she gets closer and sees that the man is a traveler and that he's a Jew. We will notice as they speak together how this understanding of who Jesus is, her understanding goes from he's a Jew to he is sir or master to he's a prophet to he is the Messiah and the Savior of the world. But the conversation begins when Jesus breaks the ice and asks for help. He just asks a simple question. Will you, will you give me a drink? And she responds with some confusion because she notices the cultural difference with, between them and the Jew and the Samaritan. These two groups did not associate with one another. Yet here is Jesus asking for water. There's some stranger danger going on here. Jews were the ones with more power in those days than the Samaritans and tended to treat them like jerks a little bit. But Jesus wasn't treating her as a Samaritan. Jesus was treating her as a human. And so Jesus doesn't respond to her question directly because the issue at hand is not actually about her giving him a drink. It's about him giving her a source of living water. And so instead, in verse 10, you'll see that Jesus hints that there's something mysterious about his identity. She thought that she knew who he was. One of those stuck-up Jews. But Jesus says that she doesn't know who he is. Jesus says something about the free gift of God, but she doesn't really catch on what he means. But she does hear that he offers living water. Living water is a term meaning clean, pure, flowing water, as opposed to dead water that would be sitting in a cistern or a rain barrel. In Canadian terms, living water versus not living water would be the difference between Rocky Mountain glacier water or taking a glass out of your local Saskatchewan slough. <laughs> to offer living water sounds pretty spectacular, but kind of confusing in the dry hills of Samaria. Let's read verse 11 through 14. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. So we see first off in verse 11, the stranger danger is gone. Instead of calling him a Jew in a spiteful tone, she uses a term of respect, calling him sir, or translated more literally, master. That's, that's an upgrade. She's starting to realize that there's more to this dusty pilgrim man than meets the eye. She is realizing that he is a greater person than herself. But Jesus is claiming to be a source of water, a source of life that is comparable to the well that he's sitting on that was dug by Abraham's grandson, Jacob. See how in verse 12, this well is connected in her mind to Jacob himself? The well is great because Jacob is great. This well gives great water because Jacob gives great water. If Jesus gives better water, then he must be better than Jacob. But Jacob is greater in her mind than anyone except for Abraham and Isaac because in her cultural perspective, a father is always worthy of more respect than a son. And Jacob was literally the father of all Israelites, including the Samaritans. When she asked the question in verse 12, she is expecting a negative answer. Looking at verse 12, her question could be read as, you, you couldn't 
be greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well. But Jacob had only given an earthly water fountain. To believe in Jesus is a heavenly, spiritual, eternal source of life. Take note of verse 13 and 14. This is the first of three places in the story today where Jesus says something that has extra deep meaning that John wants us to take careful note of. Verse 13 is a description of human wells, and the contrast is in verse 14, speaking of Jesus, the greater well. See in verse 13 that our constant need for water is a real thing that keeps on bringing us back. We constantly have to be taking care of this need in our life. Well, it's true. We have a lot of needs in our life. We, and, and they're real things. The psychiatrist Abraham Maslow, maybe you've heard of this, listed some of our needs in different categories. Like, we have physiological needs. We need water, we need food, we need oxygen, shelter, clothing. We also have some other needs. We have safety needs. We need financial security. We need health. We need safety from injury. And we even have social needs. We need friendship. We need family. Some would say we need romantic relationships. We need community. Jesus isn't trying to discount that we have these needs. Just like Jesus isn't saying that we should never drink a glass of water again now that we have Jesus. Jesus isn't trying to discount that we have earthly needs that we constantly are seeking to fulfill in our lives here on earth. I take in life, you could say, from my diet, from my work, from my marriage, from my friendships, from my interests, But none of these compare to the life that I take in from Jesus. We all have many needs. We drink from many wells. But none of these needs compare to the capital N need, one and only need, that is the great need that Jesus is going to fix with living water. You could say, what is this great need? You could say that Jesus is offering to solve this great need in our life by bringing reconciliation with God and redemption of our souls. You would be correct. But he's being a bit more descriptive and and it's explaining even more of a picture of what that reconciliation with God looks like. The Samaritan woman thought that she knew how to be reconciled already. I mean, offer enough sacrifices and don't break too many more commandments, and you should be good. But what Jesus offered to her goes far beyond working really hard to clean up her religious face. Jesus is offering her Eden in the soul. Eden in the soul. Okay, let's look at this. First, In verse 14, the Greek grammar tells us that instead of needing to continually go back to the well to drink water, once we decide to drink the living water Christ offers, we are changed forever. It's about making that decision, and it's a forever change. Instead of a constant chore of drawing more water, Christ actually opens up a well inside of us that bursts open in a fountain of eternal life. We have been talking about Jesus as the greater well, but here we see that Jesus is the great well digger too. When you receive Jesus, something fundamental changes inside your very soul, and it's described as a fountain of water, a well being dug out that comes up with water. Okay, Did you know that throughout scripture, there are connections between the images of fountains, rivers, eternal life, and the presence of God? Jesus brought up eternal life, that the fountain comes up to eternal life. Well, think about Genesis. In Genesis, we're told that Adam and Eve had two choices in front of them. They could choose the tree of sin, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, or the tree of eternal life. 
Humanity took the tree of sin, but the living water Jesus offers gives the everlasting life that Adam and Eve missed out on in Eden. Also, the Garden of Eden, there was water, there was rivers. Now, in our English translation, that river picture, it says the wa garden was watered because a mist came up out of the earth and watered the earth. But did you know that in the Greek translation that was being used in Jesus' day, it says a fountain of water came up out of the ground and became the watering mechanism for the earth in Eden? There's a fountain of water that fed that river that then became four rivers, watering the whole garden and watering the whole earth. God's presence was there in the garden. The garden was a place where man and God were reconciled and had fellowship. It was like a temple where man would go and meet the very presence of God. And so, perhaps... Does it seem like this fountain of water might be coming from the very presence of God in the Garden of Eden? The reason why I suggest this is because of Ezekiel and Revelation. Because if you look in Ezekiel 47, if you look in Ezekiel 47, there's a vision of Israel at a time where the throne of God is in Jerusalem and a river is coming from the throne and coming from the temple and wherever the water flows, this river of water, everything dead comes to life. Also, in Revelation 22, there is a vision of the eternal state where a pure river of living water is flowing out from the throne of Jesus. And again, its water brings life to everything it touches. And so from the throne of Jesus, the very presence of God, there's this fountain there's this river of living water that brings life to everything it touches. So, according to Jesus, our human hearts can either be dry deserts or have a fountain dug into it that gives out life-giving water gushing out from inside. So, is that something that's just like a human level, like... Oh man, if I just pep talk enough, then I'll, then I'll have this fountain inside of me. No, we're talking about the very presence of God. Why do I say that? Well, it's on Jesus' mind. Let's see what he says on the topic. Turn a couple pages to the right. John 7, 37 through 39. John 7, 37 through 39. It reads, On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. The beauty of the new covenant, the beauty of being a believer in Jesus, is that with living water, God doesn't stay outside. God's presence, made tangible by the Holy Spirit, moves in to live in the deepest part of our soul, which is called our spirit. The Christian soul is like a palace for Jesus the King. The throne, his throne, is set up in our heart. And wherever the throne of God is, there is a river of living water flowing from it. In Samaria, they called Jacob's well the fountain of Jacob. Jacob dug a well in the earth, and it gave life to the towns in the area. Jesus is the great well digger, greater than Jacob. And whoever drinks in Jesus will have the fountain of the Holy Spirit, the fountain of the presence of God, bursting up inside their heart. Makes me thirsty.
The Samaritan woman probably didn't get the whole picture yet. But she understood who needed to ask whom for a drink. Let's read verse 15 through 18. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to him, Jesus said to her, You have well said I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. You spoke truly. So we see in verse 15, this girl is ready to receive. Jesus said that he could address her biggest need. She knew she has lots of needs, and anything that could help, she wanted. But Jesus asks her to bring her husband. Why did he do that? Remember, a woman in a traditional culture is closely tied to her home and to her man. It would be assumed that she's married, and in a marriage, it's important to talk through all major life decisions together. So when Jesus says to bring her husband into the conversation, on one level, he is saying, okay, we're talking about a big decision. Let's bring your husband into the conversation so that you two can, you two can be on the same page. You two can hear the gospel together. If a married woman keeps her husband out of a question, it probably means that it's not a big deal. It's just a minor side note. So Jesus is saying the decision to believe in Jesus can't be a footnote or a tangent in our lives. Jesus is not looking to be anyone's side hobby. When we encounter Jesus, he demands all of us to show up come to the conversation. When it comes to having God in our lives, all the cards need to be on the table. He is not just looking for your best. He is looking for your best and your worst. He is looking for your future and your past. And he is looking for everything in between. And so Jesus is saying, hey, it's been a nice chat, but what you want me to do for you requires you to bring your whole life into this conversation. So in verse 17, she explains, well, I'm alone. I'm a single. And Jesus says, man, you are so alone in this world. Your history it speaks of a lot of desperate and a lot of dysfunction. I know you. I know where you've been and the choices you've made. I know just how out of control your messy life has been. None of us have anything much to offer to God. All of us have problems. Some of us have problems more obvious than others. This gal was definitely known as a girl with problems. She needed a dad. She needed a man. She needed God. Pause there for a moment. Did you notice the Gospel of John gives two very different dialogues in chapter 3 and chapter 4? In chapter 3, Jesus dialogues with one of the most religious, most polished people, a high-ranking Jewish, Jewish teacher named Nicodemus. In chapter 4, Jesus dialogues with one of the least religious, obviously messed up people, this lady who just can't get her Samaritan life together. Both of these individuals became lifelong Jesus followers who told the story of Jesus wherever they went. They told their story of, how they, of when they met Jesus. And so no matter who we think we are, we have nothing 
if we have not had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. Now, when Jesus tells the Samaritan woman her story, she realizes that she needs to up her guess as to who this dusty pilgrim man actually is here at the well. Let's read verses 19 to 24. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do. Do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. That went from stuck-up Jewish guy to sir to prophet. Now, the Samaritans taught, they actually taught, that Moses had been the only prophet. So Jesus would be the first prophet in a long, long time. Which meant that now was her chance. If Jesus was a prophetic person who was aware of what was happening in the spiritual then she could ask the big question. She could ask him about the flashpoint issue that had always stopped her from taking Jews seriously. See how in verse 20, she asks him which political grouping has the right answer? Some might say that this was a counter flare, a red herring, to take the conversation off of her broken love life. Maybe true, but I think that it was a real issue in her mind. The whole debate over whose worship was truly blessed by God was a legitimate obstacle to her faith in the God of David. Without getting an answer to this question, she wouldn't be able to make sense of trusting Jesus. This is why Jesus gives her the correct answer to her question. See in verse 22, Jesus gives a no-bones-about-it, straightforward answer to her question. The salvation of a, is a, from the Jews. There are real answers to even the hottest topics debated in the public square today. And Jesus knows them. But often, the best answer is not answer A or answer B, but a more nuanced answer called answer C. Answer A, to sacrifice at an altar in Mount, on Mount Gerizim in Samaria, that was a bad answer. Answer B, to sacrifice at the temple in Jerusalem, that's a better answer. Answer C, the real answer was that worship was going to be revolutionized because Jesus, the Messiah, was here. Verses 23 and 24 are the second of three places in the story today where Jesus says something that has extra deep meaning that John wants us to take careful note of. A few things to notice, repeated, emphasize in verses 23 and 24. First, the hour is coming. Things are going to change. The Lamb of God was being prepared The Spirit of God would soon be poured into the hearts of believers. The mission to take the word to the world would soon start. So the hour was coming when everything changed. But point two, many might worship, but only those who passed two tests would authentically be worshiping God. The first test is that authentic God worshipers must be worshiping in spirit. To worship in spirit means to focus on invisible, spiritual things rather than physical, tangible things in our worship. 
This is one of the biggest differences between New Testament worship and Old Testament worship. And to this day, this is a guiding principle in our worship. Our worship should be kept simple externally, physically, so as to leave room for a spiritual focus. To worship in spirit means to worship from the deepest part of who we are as human. It's more than passion. It's more than emotion. But it's not less than those things. The second test of an authentic go- of a, the second test is that authentic God worshippers must be worshiping in truth. We worship the God who cannot lie. As we worship God, if our worship doesn't correspond to truth, our worship cannot be received as authentic worship. This is why knowledge is necessary for Christian worship. Unless we study the truth of God diligently, our worship could be disqualified. If we don't know anything about God, how would we worship him? This is why we constantly seek the Lord in his word. Did you notice that in verse 23, the Father is seeking people who will worship him authentically? God desires, notice that word seek, God desires us to know him and to worship him authentically, to worship him spiritually. God is recruiting worshipers now. The the job posting has gone public. This Samaritan woman is being sought out to be a worshiper. And God is asking you, to be his worshiper. So, will we respond to him? Let's read on from verse 25. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to him, I who speak to you, am he. And at this point, his disciples came and they marveled that he talked with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? The woman then (laughs) dropped her water pot, left her water pot, went her way into the city and said to the men, come see a man who told me all things I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. So at this point, the Samaritan woman realizes that she has found the true Messiah. So she drops her water pot and runs into her town to share the good news with everyone so they can encounter Jesus too. The Apostle John, Pastor John, isn't quite done his story for us yet. He, He hasn't quite driven home all the points that he wants for us as Christians to take from this day. And so let's read verses 31 through 38. In the meantime, his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Therefore the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him anything to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me, and to finish his work. Do you not say there are still four months, and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes, look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have entered into their labors. So, talking with a Samaritan woman, Jesus was thirsty for water, but spoke of living water. Now, talking to his disciples, it's lunchtime, and Jesus is hungry for food, but he speaks of eating spiritual food, that they know nothing about. Jesus has a lesson for his disciples. 
And this here is the third of the three places in this story today where Jesus says something that has extra deep meaning that John is wanting us to take careful note on, to chew on. Food fills us and sustains us. Food keeps us going and gives us strength to work hard. Jesus says that to accomplish the will of his heavenly Father and to complete the tasks given to him is like food for him. Doing God's will was a fulfilling experience for Jesus, and it is for us as well. Specifically, Jesus is referring here to doing the work of seeking out people like the Samaritan woman to be authentic worshipers of God. Jesus is the first and greatest evangelist. Christ's work here is an example for his disciples to do similar work. Jesus graciously guided this woman to the truth about God and this is an example for us. The process of evangelizing, like Jesus did, is deeply a purpose-giving thing to experience. Noticing then in verse 35, Jesus says that the fields are already white for harvest. He is saying that the joy of seeing someone find eternal life by encountering Jesus is like the joy of a harvest festival. It's Thanksgiving. Seeds were planted the ground was watered, the weeds were trimmed. Now the standing grain is dry, it's gone white, and the only action required is to cut the stalk, bundle the head, and bring in the crop. The point is that the Spirit of God is working on people all around you. You never know exactly where someone is in terms of being ready to encounter Jesus. But Jesus is giving the encouragement to us, that people are more ready than we might expect. That, that was definitely true in Sychar that day. The Samaritan woman was totally ready to receive the eternal life that Jesus told her about. And now the whole town was going to be coming out to meet, meet Jesus too. And so Jesus is kind of prepping his disciples, training them to always be ready to give an answer for their faith. You know, there are many people who do not know about the eternal life that Jesus offers. And they would be ready to hear and respond if they knew. So look for those who, are, who may be ready to be introduced to Jesus. Jesus could, could have, Jesus could have never started that conversation at the well. He, he initiated. He stepped out. It's, it wasn't the time to be passive. And so, God has a plan for you to bring the truth of the gospel of Jesus to someone. God is sending us to complete his work. And so, listen for his leading and take the opportunity when it comes. Look for moments where you are unexpectedly alone with someone, just like Jesus was. Because God does a lot of big work when two people talk together. There is a unique joy that comes from seeing others come to faith. So look at verse 38. Christ reminds his disciples of his call on their lives. He tells them, I sent you to reap. I highlighted those words for myself and changed them just a little. God sends me to harvest. God sends me to harvest. So, are you working in the harvest? The final verses we will read today read much like the missions of the apostles throughout the book of Acts. Verse 39. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him. And we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. After spending two days with Jesus, getting to know him, the conclusion is that this is indeed the Christ, 
the Savior of the world. If Jesus is the Savior of the world and the Savior of Samaria, then Jesus is definitely the Savior of Regina and of Saskatchewan. But the gift of God needs to be opened by us personally, individually. In the end, our great need is between us and Jesus himself, one-on-one. We all pull water from many wells, but Jesus is the greatest well. Jesus is the great well digger who opens fountains of living water in our souls. And to help others to come to Jesus is our true food, which brings sustaining purpose to our lives on earth. Let's stand to close the service. You may be here today, or you may be watching online, and you might be realizing that that forever change of Christ opening up the fountain in the depths of your heart of the water, of the presence of the living God, you might be realizing that that's never happened. You might have been in church your whole life, or maybe this is your first time ever sitting under the word of God. But if that's you, today is a day that you can encounter Jesus and he can open that fountain, that river, in the depths of your heart. I can't do it for you. It's between you and Jesus alone, one-on-one, personal, just like the woman at the well. But you can talk to him something like this. Let's bow our heads and go to prayer now. If you would like to encounter Jesus, meet him, pray something like this and follow along in your heart with the words and make it your own and process it, take it in. Pray something like, Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and that I can't save myself. Lord Jesus, I ask you to be my savior to forgive my sins, to cleanse me by the power of your blood shed for me on the cross. I ask you, Lord Jesus, to come into my life and be the Lord of my life. My life is yours to direct. Lord Jesus, I ask you to send your Holy Spirit to come live inside me and to empower me to live for you and to teach me your will. I thank you for dying for me and saving me. I thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit and the guidance he will give to me. I thank you for adopting me as your son or daughter. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that, if you're praying that to encounter Jesus today, that's awesome. That's the greatest day of your life. Keep on seeking him and pressing into him until you know that that's a reality in your life. But for all of us, let's close in prayer. Father God, you seek authentic worshipers. You seek us. Just like Israel was slaves in Egypt, they were chained down and and you you sought them out you broke off their captivity and you brought them out into the freedom in which they could actually worship you truly and properly you did big and powerful things to get your people into a place of true worship and so lord even today would you do powerful things just to get us into that place of authentic worship? Would you take off the sin and the weight that that weighs us down, that distracts us, that holds us back? And may we may we know the the taste of that living water, that fountain of eternal life, your very presence. And so Lord. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your grace 
And for your goodness, you are the well, you are the well digger. And to, to represent you, to do your will, is our true fulfillment, our true purpose, and our true food. And so, Lord, we bring ourselves to you. We bring our whole lives onto the table. Take off. We repent of anything that holds us back from your will in our lives. Use us, Lord, to seek out people to be authentic worshipers in spirit and in truth. We love you. We're your people. We praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.